too late for that. Job and also that I, I pushed for that because uh, 
I found a little more extra value when there is someone showing a keynote presentation versus just a conversation on the panel. And so I want even just five, six, seven slides if I show, like, present something that we can have the panel. Uh, if you want to learn the topic and you want to learn more, please feel free to propose it to me and we can add it to the list for next year. And if you want to host a sponsor of this event, uh, it's always fun. Good, so now let's jump on the actual topic. So, obvious, on the beginning slides of what we do, we are such a gathering agency for account based marketing. We work with such companies on, on three major processes. Number one is selecting and prioritizing accounts. Number two is running the actual campaigns and executing on that. And number three is the analytics on track and everything and why and engagement and all the matters that we do. So now let's jump on the actual topic, which is um, the elements of the media growth. So I divided these four main things that we always worry about when we start with a new client or a new onboarding process. We always try to get these four things in place. So number one, we need to know what are the goals and what is the budget that we're going to have to, uh, to go after those goals. Uh, you want to make sure that the budget is realistic, the goals are realistic. So you don't want to generate or start with $10 million pipeline in uh, 30 days. Uh, but it's a you know, realistic growth and uh, you know you have the budget to get there. Uh, you want you need to have a list of target accounts, which is obviously a lot of work there. You need to have all the campaign assets in place, in banners or uh, Email, pieces, collateral, email, etc. And then you have to have your analytics and tracking in place. So now we're going to go into the details for this. So when I talk about uh, budgets and goals, so here is, a, here is an example. If you want to get to $1 million, you want to generate a million dollar in revenue in the next uh, six months, for example, or this quarter. And uh, your average deal size is 50K. Okay. Uh, you have, so you're going to need 20 customers to close to get there. So your win rate is 25%, which is not a bad win rate. So one out of four opportunities to close. So that means you need 80 opportunities. If you have a conversion rate from these two opportunities are about 33%, that means you need 240 meetings to generate before certain deadline, depending on how long your sales cycle, to get there. And let's assume your cost of meeting is $2,500, which is Pretty average, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, depending on the channel or the specific company. But let's say $2,500 a meeting, you're going to need 600 k program budget to generate a million dollar in the amount. Which is, that would be a pretty good, uh, pretty good benchmark if you if you've got that in our budget meetup, you will know that most of the SaaS companies, like the average, uh, it takes about 900 k uh, acquisition cost in the rate of million dollars. And some of them takes 1.2, 1.3 million to get a million dollar PR. But then, you know, so that is easy enough, it's still very profitable. But that's kind of like a reality check. If your budget is 100k, you probably not going to get a million dollar density. So just, just to get this in front of what you need to get, uh, to get a very deal. Uh, so, we saw the other again, other than meetings and pipeline that we want to track, other again, those are uh, account engagement by segment. So, if you have 500 accounts, how many of those uh, you want to engage? Do you want to engage with 50 of them, 30 of them, 10% of them, 20% of them? Uh, have a metric like that. So, and be able to track that engagement is very important because, especially in enterprise, it's not always a clear cut meeting. Opportunity direct resource, you're going to influence a lot of pipeline, you're going to engage a lot of accounts, you're going to start moving some accounts from cold to engage, from cold to aware. So, you want to be able to track that. Influence pipeline, of course, is another metric. Pipeline velocity. So, if you have a, if your sales team is taking now, I don't know, 120 days to close an opportunity, and you can show that the accounts that you're targeting, you're able to. They are closing at 75 days, that's worth the investment just by itself. So you want to track that as well and compare it to the account that you're not targeting. And 
finally the win rate if it's a no. So the value that happens. One of the questions that we get often, that really we're talking a second ago, is uh, how many accounts should I put in my target? How many is too many or too little? That really depends, obviously. Uh, but it sort of depends on, on how much budget you have and what kind of what size of the company are you targeting, what kind of accounts they are. If you have, uh, for example, 10 k a month budget, you don't want to target 2,000 accounts. You're going to barely move the needle on any of that. It's too much, it's too diluted, and you want to focus the effort, that's what EDM is about. It's about focusing all your efforts and resources on a smaller side of accounts. And so be mindful of your budget and your resources when you select the target accounts. Normally, for companies like the targeting market such as the price, a good target account is between 200 and 500 for a specific period of time. So normally you want to have the same list for at least a quarter, better six months, so that you have enough time to, to target multiple people in your company, different departments, and all of that. And make sure you set those accounts. If you want to choose your three, those that are cold, those that are aware, engaged, you want to have a clear decision because you're going to build different campaigns for those. Okay, so now let's talk about the assets that you need to have in place. Banner ads is an obvious one, I could also want to outline there. Uh, but it is, uh, you need to have the banner made for the team, for Facebook, for display ads, have them in all the sizes that you need so you don't have to scramble last year when you're about to last the campaign to get all the size of the team. Uh, so you start building a line for them also. You want to have the email templates already built uh, with all the sequence that you want to use to follow up at each stage of the campaign for both digital ads, content ads, and the right way. And then finally, this part that takes a lot of time for any people who have done boxes and the right mail, this can take a long like three weeks or four weeks once you start doing some back and forth on the design, find whatever you have to source, whatever material you have to source. Uh, I give you an example of this campaign that we did for this client. This this coffee are uh, handmade and hand packed, not by us, but by a local a local store in the city. So that takes about a week to just get them. When we are doing like 400, 500, 600 boxes, it takes about a week to get them ready. So you have to be prepared at the beginning. Uh, we normally do this with the holding phase, or we do that before the quarter starts, so we have all the things ready and printed when we are not. Um, the automation. So any system that needs to be connected, make sure that it's done and treated, map all the different uh, uh, notifications as well as uh, how the list needs to be created in uh, Salesforce, in HubSpot, in Marketo. Uh, all, all of your tracking should be in place and make sure all the systems are connected and head of process is in place and uh, you have informed the sales team. Uh, this is something we see very frequently where we start launching a campaign, we start generating leads, but there is not a clear path assignment of where the leads are going to go. And we have, that's why we put in place a lot of Slack notification, email notification, assignment in Salesforce, uh, all of the things that allow us to make sure that every lead is taken care of in a certain amount of time. And finally, the other things. So, uh, in this case, we have on the left a uh, uh, campaign and why dashboard where we see, okay, we spent $56,000, we can report on the pipeline, 64 uh, SAL opportunities. Uh, so you are able to track them by channel, by each single campaign, which one is actually driving most of this uh, volume. And then another report that is very important is actually taking one of our clients. Uh, when you see per set, how many accounts are you targeting, how many are you engaged within the period of time, uh, what is the percentage of the uh, accounts you are engaged, how many meetings, how many opportunities, and what's the total of So, again, you want to build the system. This is an example of a system that we run where you start on target accounts, you start running. Digital ads, LinkedIn ads, uh, 
any uh, any content out that you have, uh, and then when someone engages, we automate a follow-up email sequence, and at the same time we trigger a direct mail campaign at the right moment, and then we have a end of process when they engage. And so now I'm going to move to a couple of case studies from our clients that we did, so you can see what it looks like when it's applied to actual companies and the real situation. Uh, so this is an example of construction companies. This client allows you, for instance, is a learning platform, a uh, digital learning platform for a child. Uh, they wanted to target construction companies in the US. And so construction companies for them, they were all basically old accounts. Because there, that was a new vertical for them, and they were just recently expanding to the US after they were very strong in other regions. And so we had to start from scratch. Most of the accounts were full, if not all of them. And so we had to find the accounts to be above 100 employees, they had to employ a and a few other, um, a few other details, a few other signals that like technology they were using to build a list. Then we started putting the collateral from the banner ads, the email, as well as the direct mail box. And you can see the construction team across every single asset. Uh, the, mail, the direct mail really screens construction everywhere, so we added the school, we added the, uh, the hard hat uh, sushi roll, hard hat pen, uh, the one pager, the banner ads, everything is about the so we were talking about a specific pain of construction. We have a landing page that you see on the box. They click on the landing page, which was dash construction, so they can uh, fill out the form that they want to So this was the result. We only did this is only two months of campaign, but we spent uh, actually month and a half. We spent ninety-eight hundred dollars. Engaged uh, four hundred accounts. Sorry, we targeted four hundred accounts. That was the list. Uh, 66 account engaged, uh, 14 meetings, and 4 opportunities, $700 a meeting. So, this is just the beginning, but I worked out on the bottom from, from the start. Without even spending too much on digital, it was very strong on the direct mail piece, so we started working out those accounts with digital accounts. And then the second piece that I want to show, uh, this is a tiny tech company, software company. That and we were targeting accounts that have at least 100 employees, more than 50 engineers, and we were targeting engineering and uh, architects. So we had to pull the accounts only that they used GitHub. If they were not using GitHub, there was an immediate disqualification. So we didn't want to drive accounts that maybe are large companies that don't ask, but maybe they're using a different system, and that's a no go from the most so you can see the same thing, the bad last of the data was from the for the team side, uh, the email candidates and then the box that was very developed by engineering uh, speaking, uh, a very platform for that. We had a specific landing page that you can see there. Uh, and so that's kind of what we use uh, to drive engagement. Uh, this was a longer campaign we did for a longer period of time. So we spent 31k. Uh, we were targeting 500 accounts, we engaged 98 accounts, uh, close to 20% engagement, uh, generated 14 meetings and 6 opportunities at $2,200 per All very, very profitable uh, investment for both this uh, side. So, in conclusion, uh, you need to have a defined plan from the beginning. So, have everything clear what are your goals, what's going to be the the account is what's going to be the budget uh, and make sure that you don't stop as soon as you start spending because it's going to take some time to kind of see this through. Uh, you know the assets at the beginning, so one thing you want to avoid is having to, like I said, scrum the last thing to build banners, build print boxes, and do anything like that. And at the beginning of the quarter, for at least a whole quarter, so you are prepared that start planning ahead as well. Spend uh, some time in the beginning to define the target account list, make sure that you share the sales, that they are really, but if you don't agree, really, make sure you share why you're targeting those accounts. Uh, because you know, 
data sheets, for example, in many cases, even if sometimes they didn't gather accounts of them, but if you look at the data, it has a different story. And uh, make sure you have all the automation so you don't have to manually import, export, spreadsheet all the time. And you're tracking meetings, you're tracking engagement, you're tracking anonymous traffic. Everything has to be tracked because anonymous traffic becomes particularly important when you're doing the like mail campaign when you have a, a dedicated interface. You can see what accounts are coming to that page that you are targeting, and you can uh, finger certain actions to those. And then once you've done for a quarter, start looking at what worked for you and double down on the things that were successful right away. So you don't always look back. And the last thing that I keep repeating pretty much as I do to build the system, not a one-off campaign, you can just do it at once, just try it and you'll do it again. It's not gonna be important much. But once you build the system, even if it's very very basic at the beginning, it's a big one. This part, you're going to be able to do two, be three after, but don't stop it, keep going, and <coughs> keep uh, around this campaign. Uh, and that's it for me. Um, any questions before I jump? Yes, please. I have one or two questions. Regarding the assets that you work with, you know, the advertising pattern, yeah. email, um, and the point to recommend. So, my first question is with a list of like, Make sure that you're also looking at 
those assets are working or not, if you have good response. Once you start seeing that, you can start producing and holding an inventory, so that allows you to trigger uh, much more frequent uh, automated event. Uh, So, um, when I started doing 
is a uh, little, little uh, back up from me is I, I ran the bench and I had this crazy long goal. I was trying to explain it. At the table, our basis is just talking about needs to have scientists on the market. Uh, There's a lot more to that, but that's the tagline. Uh, but when I was doing content syndication there at the start, I kind of came in and, and we had these content syndicators and I said, okay, well, you know, let's take a look. What's our cost to lead? How many leads are we getting? How much are we spending with you guys? And, you know, no, typically in that sense, you're trying to figure out how to get the best cost per lead out of one of these guys. Right? How do I get you know, down to like 35 CPL or something like that? Uh, what I found out was that a lot of the stuff we were getting that was coming in was unqualified. Because what we were doing is saying, we're going from this persona approach and saying, you know, we want um, directors of marketing um, at software companies, right? Well, if your software company is um, you know, putting out an app on your iPhone, right? You're not selling up not really in our target, you're not in our target market, let alone on our target account list. Uh, but if you're a director of marketing and you have some technology, maybe the same type of marketing automation system we look uh, for in our target account, so you can fit that profile. So ultimately what happened was we're getting a bunch of junk leads into our system, sales isn't falling up on them. You know, uh, we're, just, you know, we're getting some outputs, some throughput uh, through it, but, but not a whole lot. Because, you know, typically content indication is a little bit higher uh, in the funnel. So what I did was I went to the content syndicator and said, here's the deal. I only want leads from people from this account, from these accounts who are you know, director, director level above in, in marketing. So he said, are you sure? Like, don't you want more leads, right? Because you're going to get less and you're going to pay more per lead. I'm like, yeah, but I'm ultimately going to end up paying less in my overall investment and get at least the same level of performance, if not improved performance, which inverts all my metrics, right? It, it, it doubles my metrics. Out of the gate. So, what I ended up doing is, 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 is implementing that with them, and so you can kind of see a bunch of the numbers here and, and as well. But, you know, we were, we were spending, what was it, 20 grand a quarter on that, getting, um, you know, what is that, 500 leads a quarter, and roughly about like, two opportunities out of that. Where what we did is we cut down and only getting 250 leads a quarter, only spending 10 grand, and still getting the, the two opportunities. So, Right away, my numbers split, right? So my spin cut in half and my cost per opportunity cut in half as well. So right away, I got a budget. I can either double down on that and say, okay, well, I do want to get 500 leads. I can, I can still afford to pay for that with the same amount of budget. And I can think about that's going to double my, my output in terms of measuring my high uh, We have a pretty strong funnel model. So once we get a, a deal into uh, a conversation, you know, more than just kind of a discovery call, but an actual sales cycle, a very strong model in terms of close rates, velocities, things along those lines. So I can forecast from that, you know, what my return is going to be. Um, and I put that data up here because we're a private company, and that's not probably available. So I can't explain to you, you know, our close rates and our ACDs and those types of things. But um, you know, right away you can see through doing content syndication, this is a quick way to kind of shift the way you're thinking about it into an ABM mindset. It really starts to improve. This is going to be the theme for the next, next couple of weeks, obviously. But um, to your point, the next one I'm going to ask a question in the practice session. Uh, the next one is around digital advertising. Uh, so, this is actually a case study from my former company where I was a client of Demand Base and I was um, part of the beta program when we launched our own advertising product. Uh, at the time, we were investing in, in Google and trying to put ads out uh, and drive um, you know, leads from, from our own. But we weren't even, didn't have a target account list at that time. We were starting um, and right away, we got that budget shut down. They kind of said, like, you guys are going to not win. You're spending a lot of money every year on all this stuff, and nothing is happening. Uh, at the company, we were best at basically practicing the traditional demand agenda model. And I can remember there was a point where I said, uh, my CEO asked me, what about my model? How many leads are you going to generate? It was a quarter million a year, and we were selling to enterprise companies. There aren't a quarter million enterprise companies out there, right? So there's no way we're going to. So I was like, this is broken, there's got to be another way. So I started working with demand based kind of thing. How do we change this? Target countless things started to develop, and then they brought this uh, product, this advertising product, to market. I said, this is great because what it's going to allow me to do is spend less and actually focus my ads specifically on the accounts that we care about. So we took a list of 500 uh, top priority accounts and put our budget against those. Uh, so looking at this, what we're actually able to do is cut that spend. Almost not quite back, about 40%, right? So I'm 
I'm leaving, leaving that down when I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm selling it to my, my executives to say, look, we're not getting leads out of this. What we are going to get is engagement from these accounts, and we're going to be able to utilize that to go in uh, and, and go in and try to drive sales opportunities by activating the sales into that. So, you know, I'll give you a baseline before that what was going on with our target accounts, because we did have uh, the legacy products at the end of which would show us when up on our website so I can figure out how many were there before when we were running some of those uh, you know, untargeted approaches. And then look at it after we target them, we target them specifically, how many were then engaging on our website. You can kind of see the numbers there, that can be 15% to 25%. So again, selling to enterprises, that's a big job. Um, that target account that's handed over the course of the next year, getting about a quarter of those into our into a sales cycle. So you know, 500 accounts we're looking that we are now engaging in. These are all, um, you know, seven deals going on. So that presents a lot of growth for the business, whereas prior to that, we were really struggling to get into a lot of these accounts. Um, and even in, in, in these campaigns, there was a really interesting uh, case. That was a case that we didn't expect to take it down since I paid it for you. But uh, we were competing against uh, some of the big ESPs and on Black Friday, and one of them was down. So many of them were the clients. They're, they were not able to send emails out on Black Friday. Like, you imagine, yeah, like that's like, mm. um, So I came up with sort of creative ad that was like, put your ESP down on Black Friday because our friends told me to be free. Right? So, you know, a really catchy message to, to do that and bring them there to help drive some of that engagement on top of making sure that only our ads would be shown to those, those companies we weren't spending on on influencing anything else, anyone else out there. Um, the ads you can personalize on Black is like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
without having you know, full bore. I mean, you're going to need a target powers in a moment to do that stuff, but you know, you don't need full, full, full sales and marketing alignment and all this out of operationalization and all those other things that can go in are really more of the more challenging parts of the end that you have to work through. Um, the technologies, things like that, and you have to show them start back and start to show that, hey, look, if we really do rally around these accounts and prove to be the best one in business, look at what's happening and how much more efficient these marketers need to be to help actually Um, great, so those are a couple of the kind of quick ones. So the next um, programs I wanted to go through, and, and you know, I gave uh, Frank a slide to take me, so there's one there about you know, iterating, growing, and learning, and I'm really going to um, come off of here. But um, I was thinking about some different campaigns and just going through some old decks and pulling stuff up. And um, some of the stuff I think has worked really well for us over the years has, has been direct mail, so no surprise, it's a common theme. Um, and we started doing this. Um, because we felt that there was a lot of noise out there in digital, it was hard to kind of get attention and things like that. It was a, a different attack, a tactile attack. So many people get in, in their, um, you know, in, in hand in the office, things like that, and they cut the noise. And so we started doing it actually with product launches because the first one we really did was around the launch of our ABM platform. So, um, not where I showed everybody where this, but we actually didn't even have a UI you could log into until about this time two years ago. When I was a customer, it was all kind of white glove service. We do ads, here's the target panelists, here's the creative demand nation, the set it up, launch and report, all that kind of stuff. So it's almost like an agency model in a lot of ways with a uh, back end product, which is a database and some sets of APIs that can work with that data. Um, so when we brought a UI to market, we were obviously very excited about that, right? That was a, a huge jump for us. Um, and so we really wanted to get the, get the work out there. So we said, let's do a direct mail campaign. Um, let's get out there, let's drive some awareness, let's drive some opportunities, let's see if we can get some of the stuff sold. So really, that was, that was the objective, right? Was to say, you know, we're announcing this, we want to highlight this to our target accounts and really show our competitive difference. Um, and, you know, at the time, the product was really just about identifying the target accounts um, that you can get in there and manage yourself and then incorporate some, uh, some understanding of, like, Prioritization and things like that. So, uh, you know, we said, okay, great, we've got this platform. Now, who are we going to go send it to? Um, you know, we want to make sure we're, we're going to obviously our target accounts, um, and we want to make sure again we kind of find the, the buying team on these things. The, you know, beyond just the influencers, the decision makers, and the heavy influencers are uh, directing the work on most of our accounts. So, those are kind of the, the, the audience we wanted to send it to. Uh, and then we also had, so we had our sales team had select uh, some green field accounts, and we also said, well, let's also, you know, let's throw in a couple kind of deals we lost, right? Because we lost a competitor, you know, the platform should be a, uh, a new enticing thing to kind of get them to come back, uh, things like that. Um, or even customers who left for one reason or another. And hey, it's always worth it. Send a couple of those out and see if, um, if that does, does much to try to. Uh, Uh, so, how we went through that process. So, in CRM, we have our target account list all tagged. It's a, it's a checkbox on the account record. So, we can do reporting and measurement and all this other stuff against those, those sets of accounts. Um, within that, we have a sub segment, which is called the uh, time of this, it's the like 80 and 30. Um, and what that really means is the account executive and 30. So, they go in and they prioritize the accounts that they want us to focus on. And I, I did this earlier. Like, I'm a sales rep, uh, I want you to focus on that account, right? So, you know, sales people could be good at trying to figure out, do research, to understand which accounts they should be going after now, but, um, you know, ideally, maybe that's not the most effective way to do it, but at the time, we really didn't have a whole lot of options in how to go to market for doing that, and, you know, we wanted to make sure our sales people were, were happy with what we're doing, we were aligning, and, and they got value out of that, so we basically allowed them to say, you know, here are the accounts I want you to send. Um, and here are the people in those accounts. Um, then what Mark we would do is kind of take on um, the middle part of this, of this initiative, which is to go out and you know, verify the mail address of these, these people, and make sure that you know, we're not going to get a bunch of returns out of all this investment. Um, I didn't go into kind of the cost of these uh, in my slides, but I think it's important to note. It's fairly aligned with some of the stuff Frank would have to you know, we, we had a, a custom vendor who makes you pay for us and puts our little brand. Stuff. So you know, we're excited to celebrate our, our new platform and things like that. So we designed all the stuff, you know, you can see the, the inserts that go in there. Um, and I'll show you 
this slide and the next slide some of the data that might be behind that. Uh, but then what we would do is provide air cover for that. So we put some ads out in the market targeting those accounts, um, and driving them to uh, specific landing pages. So I think what you'll find in these complex sales is you're relatively rarely getting click-throughs on these ads. They're really serving you as more of a branding impression. Um, and so people will kind of show up uh, on the website. You know, um, and then what we would do is we provide intelligence reports that web activity that engage to the sales team. So they knew when those accounts were responding and they were going around the ad and showing up on the website, and then they could jump into action and respond. So here's uh, some of the creative that was behind it, the public information and the behavior styles and such. Uh, you know, really started to bring a level of excitement into it, right? Uh, like, yay, we're, we're so excited. And, you know, a lot of our brand consistency and they have been being to build the message. Uh, you can see kind of the ads where the orange letter is that's some of the personalization I was talking about. So you can actually call out the company name so when they see the ad, it's speaking directly to them. Uh, you know, pitch for a product or a license that's dynamic. So you're not creating a banner for each company. Um, we actually can just personalize that. So you just want to create a creative size and substitute the data in there. We can change out and kind of do all that stuff depending on. Messages for or something like that. Uh, and then we were just basically sending them to the uh, you know, sort of general product and the video of it and trying to get them educated. So that's the information we're passing off to sales to say, hey, you know, one of your accounts that sent me direct mail just showed up, watched, looked at the content on the site uh, of your platform, go after it, get on it, and then try to, uh, uh, try to get sales out of it. So we did, you know, we did a press release about it and we sent out a product announcements or a game. But we've done that previously, and quite frankly, that doesn't generate any data. We don't get any data out of that. So, uh, this is really like how we put a marketing campaign and integrating campaign behind a uh, product launch data. So, here are some of the stats about it. So, in doing that, we targeted 452 accounts that were selected by our reps. Uh, we set a goal of a primary generation rate of 18%. So, of that 452, we stacked that we're going to get about 80 different sales. A little bit higher performance rate, what we're seeing with some of the franchise clients, but um, you know, we've been practicing this a little bit longer. This was just kind of a new, new uh, campaign and tactic we're putting into place. So, um, you know, we've been pursuing many of these accounts uh, prior to the launch of this. So, we were feeling pretty good that we were able to hit that. Um, what we saw in terms of performance was that we actually had you know, a high power generation rate of about um, 20% of generating the of opportunities. So, you know, that's 100. Gave us was a new bench, a benchmark to come into our next product launch in, in our next uh, you know, direct mail campaign. So as we came back around that, we said, okay, well, um, how can we make this better? How can we improve? How can we grow on, on what we did already? And so at this point, we were getting ready to launch um, our new targeting solution. So that's the, the advertising product, but we had built this new layer on top of just targeting the IPs where we can target those showing intent on the topics that are relevant um, you know, for us or you know, for a client's business and really focus in and target on those individuals. But that's the, the perceived buying time more so than the perception, right? If you're going to target account and you're reading about ABM uh, out on a forum or something like that, you can see that happening. And so we can make sure that we target our ads uh, to you specifically. So the actual buying team within, uh, within the company and you know it's not just a uh, you know, someone in the market department. Right, you might be someone in finance or procurement, like, who is this company you're evaluating? Why are we doing you know, looking at these contracts? Um, we can make sure you target it on, on them as well because they're showing that single intent. They're not the ultimate buyer, they're an influencer as well, part of that process. So we can make sure that we set pairs and that our markers don't get as much friction as this work in that cycle. Uh, you know, what we wanted to do here, though, is obviously target the, you know, the same types of marketers in our target account, really focus in on the accounts that are showing interest in. Type of product versus let's let sales just say, hey, here's you know our top accounts you want you to go after. Uh, and so, uh, um, so what we did is we took a little bit of tact to, to building the sub segment of the product analysis that we're going to go after. And so, you know, you'll notice on the left um, most of the um, uh, things that we're doing there are about the same. With the exception of the first bullet, and then the 
we're below the very last one. So um, this is, you know, instead of just the rep self selecting the accounts, we went in and looked for accounts with interest in these specific topics. So if you look at the kind of image in the background, which is a uh, purposely obscure image of our product, because I didn't want to like you know, do much of that stuff, but you can kind of see some of those terms that have been at the top, and some of the different tech terms we have in our, our profile, which is how we track all that stuff. Uh, so that you can see that those are the right types of, of, uh, of, of these topics that these accounts are, are researching and looking at. So in theory, our solution and what we're providing them should be of interest in the time it should be should be right. Uh, again, we go from mailing addresses, we design all the direct mail, um, you know, and to frame this point like these things don't just pop out of the out of the work. It gets a lot of uh, lead time for this. Uh, and so these are the types of things you build an inventory of them so that you then can repurpose it and go back and you know, have that lead time for creating uh, the direct mail pieces because you know the champagne ones actually move pretty quick because the champagne's there and it's got print labels if they're on the box. Um, you know, we're going to create a custom box and you know find these glasses and then design print custom inserts and all those things, you know, and then make sure that our, our ads are online and we're personalizing the website and everything when these companies show up. You know, Hero banners, you know, there's a lot more work that kind of goes into to getting that off the ground and the lead times are, are, are much longer. So, so again, what we're doing is we're warming these accounts up with the ads of driving the, the value proposition for, the, um, for that product, um, personalizing the website with that same message when they show up to some of the banner on the home page, um, and then sending them a direct mail which has that same feel. So, different than what we saw. We've now honed it in where anywhere that you see ads on the website, you may use the right melodies, they're seeing that same message, the, the same creators, and things like that. So it really drives the right to code. Um, and so, you know, again, we're, we're activating them with alerts to go call on those accounts. Um, you know, they're prioritizing who they want to call first based upon two things. One is we've received um, engagement on the website, and then two is kind of that last bullet. This time, because we're making a, a, you know, a more traditional direct mail vendor, we actually need Back to, to sales, so they actually know that the um, that the direct mail is delivered and received, and that would be an activation point for them to start calling on them. Um, so they can use the website engagement uh, as well as the delivery notice as a prioritization mechanism to go in and say these are the accounts you know I should be focusing on uh, right now. Does that work? All right. So this one blew the doors off, right? So. Our, our approach for looking at and using intent to prioritize how we're, um, we're developing the list for a campaign like this, uh, you can see that it was a smaller list. It was only 394 accounts versus the previous one was uh, 354 accounts. Or 452 accounts. Uh, you know, our, our pipeline goal was about the same, right? So we took our 20%, we said, okay, you know, that within 20%, let's not get too aggressive, let's draw that, you know, draw that line as our, our baseline. But we assume we're probably going to perform better, so you know, we're kind of sitting back in a little bit. But uh, you know, at this level, we're saying that's great because the idea is we're going to set ourselves up for success and we can improve the model. Um, certainly better to overshoot than to undershoot, but there's always the question of profit forecasting as well. But um, you know, what we saw actually was that we, we converted the pipeline at a rate of 28%. We got 100, and it was 110 different, different opportunities. So that's 100, almost 140 percent. Right, whereas the last one was like right at 100 um, percent, just over 100 percent of So you know that's a great growth rate. I think it was it was like a 42 percent growth rate when you compare previous conversion rates to, to intent-based conversion rates. Um, and what that really helps us do is to justify the investments that we do because you know they're not they're not cheap campaigns, right? When you're sending it out to 300 and you know 400 other accounts, you're spending 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars on that, but you know, when we get uh, 100, 110 at bats, um, and we apply you know our average convert or average close rate to A C B, the bookings on that, you know, the pipeline of that is actually the bookings, the true ROI on that campaign is you know, makes it a no brainer for us. So, um, direct red mail has consistently been one of our you know, workhorses of, of our ABM practice. Um, you know, we do a lot of other campaigns that run our email list and other you know all that different stuff with webinars and events and assets. All that kind of stuff too, but um, you know, this one is the one that really seems to, to drive the consistent for us and continue 
to return to it and then iterate on it as well. So during the holidays, we now do holiday wine for our customers as well as a few prospects, and we try to kind of keep the cadence of this going um, every quarter of launch. So we're not fully automated in terms of a trigger that says, you know, hey, they're engaged now, fire it off. Uh, whereas we kind of take a look at okay, over the next quarter, what are the priority accounts? You know, what is our message we need to get in the market? Which accounts are best suited to receive that message? And let's go out and, uh, you know, and use what we have and we launch that. So we don't have to do a full rev of developing directly on that time. We can go in and utilize some of the things that are stored up in our inventory kind of on our shelves, which means the majority of our work is in you know, refining the list for execution and enabling sales to go out and, and take action. So that really shortens our, our timelines uh, for launching these campaigns. You know, when we first build these, you know, we're talking uh, probably like a, a month or two months you know, end to end from really having to start messaging and design to having an album on and hitting, uh, hitting the desk. So now we can turn those around and then usually in about a month, so you know, much shorter. Um, I didn't do a little wrap up slide here, but I think if I if I had to do a couple of key takeaways, um, they would they would be um, I would I would think about you know, making sure that you're you have the list, you, know, you feel comfortable with the list, doesn't have to be perfect. Lists are always going to iterate, but that you're finding a way to really hone in on the right accounts on that list for the types of campaigns that you're running. Um, so there's different levels of, of ADM, and so you know if you're thinking about it directly, it's going to be a more bespoke approach, right? Smaller set of accounts, several hundred, versus you know, if you're thinking about you just need to warm up some accounts um, that are cold, you're going to use different tactics there. You might think about some advertising or um, you, know, you might even think about content syndication kind of drives some awareness about different products and value propositions. You know, for us, a lot of the time, for the earlier, we really get getting people familiar with what any of it is, what it means, not why they should use their product, products. It's the, the challenge of sales. Like, if you lead them to their problem and how they think they should be fixing it, all of a sudden they understand where your product's fit, uh, fitting and start to do that. So a lot of our work was on the education, whereas there's a lot more understanding about it out in the market today, so we shift a little bit more into the explaining the how, and this is how you can do it, and there's you know, a multitude of different quick uh, ways to, to do it. So I'd say, you know, really think about the target account list, um, get um, a way to prioritize that, and make sure you're always measuring and telling the story from the bottom of the funnel, because that's what really Wins the strategy for you and showcases the value of what you're doing with ADM. Because um, I always like to say, like, there's some person who never said, like, how is it click through to click through? Like, it never happens. But they say, like, how many opportunities am I going to get out of this? And that's where that alignment comes together. When you're thinking about delivering that to them, that's when you really get to hone about your yeah. campaigns and make sure your campaigns are doing what they're supposed to be doing in your organization. So, uh, so with that all, I have any questions? Uh, we got a couple. I'll we'll start with the back end of the way. So, for Taylor, uh, did you have to create a program with any uh, direct mail uh, platform? We, we talked then to PFL and some others about partnerships. Um, and what we came to the realization was that uh, those already integrate with other systems. Integrate CRM and marketing automation and things like that. So we can supply our intelligence through those systems to activate. And there wasn't really a strong use case for direct integration there. So, um, so now what you would be using is, is actually you know, coming up with accounts with us, maybe even prioritizing those through those other systems into action. Yes. Um, when you're thinking, I mean, it seems like you're building really like highly built campaigns that all have the same messaging. How do you think about the study? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, for example, we now do product launches. We'll have a webinar with we'll that too. But right. So, um, the webinar is going to tend to be a big pipeline driver, much like the ads or you know the, the product launch announcement kind of stuff. Uh, they tend to be kind of more informational, and these are the ones that kind of really, uh, really get the, the job done. Uh, for example, I didn't bring this story because it's, it's a little bit shorter, but the next evolution of our content syndication is that we actually started thinking about prioritizing the content and the accounts we're targeting the content syndication based upon their intent and their interests. 
So instead of saying hey, contents indicator, you know, it'll do a plug in to the main works in order to configure it. Uh, if they were the one actually then, you know, they were going to do a more reason, like, no, you could this is how we want to do it. And actually it came back to review and was like, I just had 13 meetings this week, and like rather than ask only for me to the target account, like what are you doing to do that? But they were very responsive. So what we're doing with node balance, instead of saying, okay, here's like four assets and you still promote that to these accounts and these leads, we actually say, okay, this set of accounts is interested in this, promote this asset to them. This set of accounts is interested in this, this asset to them. And that has actually um, jumped up our pipeline generation rates from contest indication by 63%. Uh, now, mind you, that's like the difference between 10 and you know, 16 to 17. So it's not a huge bump. But again, we're spending the same amount of money we're moving the needle in the performance of that, of that channel. So, um, so other campaigns, other things we do, like just you know more traditional webinars or promoting an ebook or, or things like that. Um, those are, are more of our kind of more traditional to edge of stuff. Um, and when you look at that as more very top of the funnel, kind of either contact acquisition or thought leadership piece stuff. But what we do do is we don't just say like, okay, you, you register for a webinar or whatever. Um, Virtue. Like we'll, we'll stick our sales people after those responses. So not everybody who registers for the webinar is on the target account, but when we deliver our enablement and our follow-up reports, we limit their view into responses by those from target accounts and we'll prioritize those first. They can still see the other stuff if they want to, but the idea is like, hey, don't spend your time on that stuff because quite frankly, you know, it's gonna even if you get a sales cycle going, it's not gonna go anywhere. The sales managers are gonna shut it all down. Why you sell these companies? Um, and so, not to make kind of use those, and so like that ABM lens, right? You can still do it for a more traditional demand approach, um, but we can we can focus the out, output of it for our sales reps so that they're really focused on the other top stuff. Following on that, like if you do like custom design for the ABM thing, does that matter to your existing design already, um, or are you like taking a whole different lens on the specific like, smaller program? Uh, the smaller ones, yeah. They're, they're just you know our brand guidelines. Pretty okay. much what you see in there in our facing they are brand guidelines. You know the, the glasses ideas. You know take, if you look at the message, like take a closer look. The idea was you know de-anonymizing. Like the idea of giving the intent is like you don't know who you should be hitting. We should help you see who that is. So um, you know we work with agencies to do that stuff, and so we conceptualize and try to really come up with the concept and feel resonance uh, before we go to market with that. So um, and we had. I have a question regarding the response rate and forward to, to direct mailers versus actual like sales reaching out. Because I noticed that you had a bunch of like mailers on your side as well. I feel like that's an incentive to get the demo, right? So the direct mailer would be the thing that actually creates the meeting. So I wanted to know just like from your perspective what the ratios were of like the direct mailer that seems to be the effective thing in these kind of campaigns versus the sales outreach for the engagement. Yeah, so we don't Goal is driving the pipeline and how much we're, we're spending against that. So the goal is that we're working in tandem with each other. So we're sending so you're all the sales people are always following up to every engagement activity, no matter what. Yeah, and from a target okay. yeah, exactly. And so when we look at performance from a company perspective, pipeline generation, our company has a pipeline, right? It's X. Um, typically, marketing generates about eighty percent or point eight X of, of the pipeline, and the other twenty percent is generated by sales. But in marketing, in terms of my variable comp, it's it's all about um, did we hit that company pipeline goal? Because as we look at our financial models, you know, our growth models, it's all dependent on us hitting that pipeline goal and maintaining our downstream funnel metrics from that. So our close rates, our ACVs, and those types of things. As long as we're consistent there, our forecasting is, is really good. And our sales cycles are anywhere between six months. So what we're producing here is you know, might close in Q1 and will most likely close by the beginning, you know, beginning of, mid of Q2. So it's critical that we're doing today to get this stuff going to make sure that we're delivering on the business growth tomorrow in order to do that. So we don't we don't get into too deep attribution. It's you know about like the source and channel and things like that. And we look at campaign as we're building, you know, as as we have a forecast, you have to generate X number of opportunities. We have to think about campaign planning, you know, how many webinars do 
somebody to run what's our average you know pipeline per webinar it tells us how many we need to run and then we can start to, to plan out those and put them on the calendar and do all those types of things so it's not necessarily like these people are requesting information or demos from these people like for, from your campaigns um it's the, the sales outreach that matters more than the yeah the, so yeah so, no, like the, i was wondering I, I don't think any of those people show up and give you an opinion someone did and give you a demo okay um it's yeah it's definitely it's sales. Sales. yeah it's okay. sales going after that content that's you get it like, and, so it's hot, yeah. uh, and things like that so um yeah it's it's, it's really a combined effort to make that happen there are probably a couple that come in and sometimes we just typically we still do problems where you know we're measuring pipeline is really the last touch model yep. right so like you do the direct mail and then they give it and there's a couple sales touches and nothing's happening you get a demo request we'll go back and kind of adjust the, the you know the attribution to that that opportunity to the to the, uh, the, the direct mail because you know that's what really drove it and you know that activity right because we want to make sure that the campaign's going to be performance for it so cool. we'll sometimes play with that a little bit to make sure but um but we also are aware that you know no buyer's journey is just one touch like some of our 2020 planning, we were looking at one account, and it was um, it was like 33 different marketing campaigns across six different people in the account over the course of like four or five months. So no one of those things did it and owns everything. There's there's the you know there's the conversion point and that sales opportunity that gets the credit for generating it. But we also look at everything else as a reinforced model. So that if something isn't getting enough pipeline credit or we believe we can look at the report and say, oh well, that's not quite doing it. But look, it's in for this five million dollars in pipeline. So it's definitely been consumed, it has value, it's just not showing up in that view of our attribution. Thank you. Great. Yes. You should, you have shared some great um, success stories of what has worked and maybe what has not. Can you share what are some of the common mistakes that you've seen work in other marketers that maybe some of the misperceptions that they have about a company's market that you still Yeah, so um, uh, I would say probably the biggest challenge that marketers run into in executing video successfully is doing it in silence. Right? So saying, I'm going to go mandate what a target account list is, I'm going to go run a campaign because I think it's going to work without having to buy in across the board from, we call it the ADM leadership team, which is you know, marketing leadership, sales leadership, ops leadership, and finance as well. Right? So we need to be building our model based on finance is forecasting for the business. We need to make sure that you know, people are sticking to it, right? You don't have marketers who are like, I don't know how to do that. I've been doing it this way forever. I'm going to do it that way, right? You run off the reservation. Um, they have to, you know, have to be you know, help, you know, look out the fire and make sure that, hey, this is how we're doing it now. We can stick to it and make it work. And you can't have sales saying, like, oh, that target hero list they created is, is junk. I'm just going to go do my, my own thing. It's quite frankly that so, for example, what we do to combat that is when we develop our target account list, we produce, we, you know, we create out the list of the size we need, which um, for us it's based upon um, the funnel metrics, the size of the sales team, and figure out how many accounts each sales rep needs to hit their quota and deliver on those funnel metrics. So we back all that out and say, okay, what's our sales health headcount? Now we know how many target accounts we need on the list to fill out the to, to do that. Um, so what we give the sales reps the ability to do is to say, okay, when we reprocess our list, um, you know, here's your you know, mid-market rep, here's your 130 accounts or whatever, um, you can go in there and scrub out 10% of those, right? So you can go take about 15, 13, 15 accounts out and put in 13 or 15 of your own, right? That you think are the right ones and they can show up in this list. That way we have that buy-in and we can say, it can't come back to the end and be like, oh, I'm not going to follow that stuff. I don't think that's the good account post to go after. You know, we do all the ICP, we know what that looks like. We're identifying accounts and, and, and figuring out which ones are the right, right ones to go after them now based upon you know, text and those other things. Uh, so we, we know, and that's why, you know, quite frankly, we see performance rates like that, that because we are prioritizing them. Uh, so I think the, the alignment and, and the relationship stuff is the hardest thing, right? Like building relationships across the board and getting everybody working together is, is really the hard part of ABM. And, and the stuff that has to happen up front for it to be successful long term. Not a campaign. It's a straight. It's a business. Strategy. It's how you go to market to make sure you're as effective as possible at either you know doing whatever is the goal of it is acquiring new logos, you know, growing your, your existing customer base, um, whatever whatever that is, um, breaking up partnerships. We we even did 
back in the day when we were going for funding, funding the target DCs on why they should be investing in this, right? So that's an ADM approach to going after DCs. Um, we're doing some stuff with a nonprofit right now where we're helping them raise money by targeting businesses where they want to uh, drive donations and things like that for their orgs. Um, so there's a multitude of different ways to really look at it. It's about like, being, able to, being able to go after a set of accounts and help prescribe Doing that as a better marketing business strategy. You know, if everybody's not online and doesn't get it and, and working towards it, um, that's really where the whole thing kind of jumps in and also falls apart. Good. Any other questions? All right, one more. So we don't um, we don't perceive ads as driving conversions. Uh, typically, we look at the performance of ads by generating engagement because very few people actually click through an ad, especially in the business ad. You probably get a little bit more in consumer life, right? Like if you're on Insta or whatever, you see some of those cool shoes that are like you know like, like bulletproof stuff and they step on nails or whatever. You guys get that one? Like, <laughs> they look really cool. I keep wanting to buy them. Like that's awesome. It's like stepping on nails and the car drives over this button. It's like made out of Kevlar. Anyway, uh, I'm about to click through that every time I see it. But like if I saw an ad for a software provider, I would never click through it. So what we how we look at it is is they're going to drive awareness. And what's going to happen most of the time is when that awareness really starts to land and they start to think, hmm, maybe we should go look at that. It's probably not going to happen when they see the ad. So they're going to go Google search or something else. So how we measure it is what we call the limit which is uh, an increase in engagement from those accounts while those ads are running. And you, and you bait it, that's what I was saying, kind of in the ad when you baseline that before you turn on the ads against those accounts. And now you can see more engaging. Um, you can jump in and you know, activate sales because now they're starting to come to you and show some interest. Um, I did a study a couple of years back where um, two levels for advertising. One was when accounts were engaging on our website and lifting, they were 60% more likely to go into pipe. Uh, than accounts that were not lifting. And then I did another study where I actually took half of our target account list, broke it half, advertising one half, not the other. Those that were receiving ads went into pipeline at a 45% better rate than those that were. All other things being equal, all other marketing not being changed, the way you're, you're practicing and going after them. So that was kind of justifying the, the investment in, in the ads uh, and things like that. But again, we, we look at it as more as driving the engagement. Um, from those accounts, and so sort of clicking through an ad, filling out a form, showing you know, the user their parameters, track back to, the, to that ad, and that's what we generate our pipeline for. So it's really more of a mix of attributions to drive that pipeline. And again, we're not as concerned about the channel or the source as long as we get to that pipeline and we do so in an effective way. Yeah. Does that change the way that you design ads? So if it's, if it's about them just getting the ad in front of them and not necessarily clicking through. Yeah, so I think the way we, we perceive that is we're not necessarily going for like a, a direct campaign promotion, right? So not promoting an event or an ebook or a webinar. We're promoting kind of like the product or some brand awareness and, and why, you know, as kind of a believer in our space, like we kind of throw some swagger around and that kind of stuff. So like you know, when the wave came out, we're like, hey, don't you want to work with a leader? Right? Do, you know, do we need to do more than that? Like, when we talk about the feature function stuff, or can we do that? And that's okay, well, let me go look. I'm thinking about this, let me go look at them. That was about to get them to show up on our website and activate sales and, and so forth. So, typically, our ads will do that, though. Um, we'll, do, we'll do some retargeting around that that is more focused on specific event stuff. So, for example, like what I would do is for a, I did, we did one time for a product launch, you know, that kind of awareness, and then if you showed up um, and hit the product page, we would retarget you with an on-demand on -demand webinar about that product. So that way, it's like if you're already been in the page more, now let's give you a conversion based offer for that. Um, you still don't see a lot of click through and that kind of stuff. Another one we do is um, we have an annual conference, which is coming up uh, in March here in the city. And so all throughout Q1, we'll retarget anybody from the target account that hits our website with that offer. Which is, you know, you sign up for our, our event, and it's over at uh, 347. You know, it's a, it's a conference, right? So it's fee based and all that kind of stuff. So um, you know, 
that's that's kind of where we're putting we'll put an offer base there, but you know, it's gonna become some very high level kind of brand awareness because that's the impression. So what you know, what's the hump you can get out of a couple words? Because again, you know, the cycles you see through this three three ads, like I'm trying to what the ID um, ID is, but it's I think it's like fifteen seconds or something like that to most of those three frames. So you're not getting a lot of time to get a lot of message across. And you need something that's gonna pop out. So that's why we see personalization in the first frame and cast an eye. A follow message and personalization in the last frame. Because that last frame after 15 seconds, it stops on that frame. And that's the last message you see. So you gotta the way I've always advised our team is the amount of content you can put in those ads in those three frames is, is, is the equivalent of basically an old school tweet, 140 characters. So that's what you got to work with to get the full message across. These days, that's what you got to grab your attention. So it's got to be short, punchy, pithy, and really like drive the message out. Yes? Are there anyone else here in ADR? Roughly, what percent of your budget are you putting into these kind of campaigns versus just like all the time? Other than like SEO and things like that? Yeah, so um, I mean, as a provider of an ADR product, we nice over everything that we do. There are uh, channels, SEO, SEM, which we are not ADM funds. We yeah. cannot, cannot do that. So um, a large percentage of our budget goes to uh, these types of, of campaigns. Uh, I had an SEM for a while, and we were trying to crack a nut on how do you ADM for SEM, because there's no way to target accounts. There are a couple ways to do it. It's highly expensive, and basically, depending on the technologies you have, we had to have like um, double click as a middleware just to pass our cookies into SEM. Another way you can do it is try to create audiences from your um, target account traffic on your website. So you can identify that traffic and create audiences. The challenge there is that typically the audience is not big enough for Google to, to activate for SEM to get below the thresholds. So like, sorry, I can't do it. But I thought it happens. Um, so what I did was I actually borrowed our, um, our field marketing strategy localized our bidding to the regions where those target accounts were. And then this is actually at the beginning of 2017 when all the other vendors came in, there were a bunch of products. So our search rankings and our SEM rankings actually dropped dramatically because all of a sudden you know, we were kind of asleep behind the wheel being part of this. It was on autopilot. And all of a sudden we were like way down the list on everything. They were eating us up. And ABM became this like email marketing play in the search term. So I kind of said, well, I forgot to back online, let's focus in those regions because we know that's where our accounts are. We can spend more for ads there because you know, we don't know if it's been searching, but the propensity that it is is, is greater. Uh, so you know that actually leaned down our, our, um, our SEM budget, uh, improved our cost per opportunity, shot up our opportunity rate from, directly from, from those, which you know you have to assume the opportunities we're getting out of those are like our target accounts. So you get tons of other qualified stuff coming in. So uh, so I, you know, some of those early case studies are kind of kind of optimized some of the budget, and what that really helps you is kind of free some of it up, right? So you have all of a sudden have you know, extra cash in your pocket. All right, let's do some more tests. Let's try something else. Let's find an ABM platform and, and invest in that, and test that out, and see you know, how that helps us in our kind of more traditional organic stuff we're doing. Um, and so you know, again, the majority of our, our budget is going to those, but you know, there's budget like um, you know, and that's our our, our demand chain budget, right? Uh, but you know you have product marketing and you have um, web development and that kind of stuff and you know they are supporting that but they're not direct campaign support so uh, when it comes to kind of our demand and our growth budget all this stuff is like going under Great, thank you so much.
I don't account that fits into that group can mandate or dictate the type of stuff you want to do. So, for example, um, our strategic accounts, we're not, I mean, we'll, we'll do some kind of always on stuff that if they're on our email list, we'll put it on our webinars and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to take a different tactic and say, okay, let's go run some on site media certifications for these companies. Let's get them trained up. Let's make sure they have, this is you know, product stuff, this is strategy stuff. How do you go to target companies? How do you run you know, the alignment across the board? Um, how do you, you know, baseline and create the performance measurements and you know, ship what you're doing today into that model? Things like that. So I would kind of step back and say, first of all, you know, what, is, you know, what do these accounts look like? What's the priority of them? You know, if those are strategic accounts, we already have some business suits and customers. How do we go and, and utilize those relationships to drive you know, greater account penetration? And that's something we're doing right now. We're looking at a, a technology that helps us measure engagement, with content, and activate sales um, for those specific use cases. So we're going to say, give them the ability to create these micro sites and then they can you know, personalize the content that's in their information account and see you know, additional people in the account are doing that. Uh, likewise, you might say, you know, if, it's, if it's more kind of a, um, you know, a lower potential account, right, like the ACD for that type of account. I turn to, to some of these campaigns and say, okay, well, um, let's go in and, and um, let's try to you know, send them the direct mail, but let's make sure that the sale is really going to happen. We're not just sending a direct mail with the URL that the business that has a form and hoping they're going to show up and fill it out. So uh, I, I find a lot of it again when you're doing ABM, it's about focusing everything on the target account list. And once you start doing that, you know, it's, you're still kind of practicing the demand gen, which is why I said the demand gen is right. Um, so it's about that and then making sure. You're learning and enabling and trying to figure out new ways to, to approach and, and revise those campaigns. So, you know, if you're thinking about webinars, for example, um, you know, does it make sense to do like a very you know vertical based webinar? You can't do that break into another vertical. Or you know, of those other accounts that are processing in vertical. So do we need to you know do three different versions of it that are verticalized and we promote you know that that on demand to each one um, so it's, it's personalized or something like that. So um, you want to boil the ocean on one side, and we can't try to do too much at, at one time. Um, so I think it's, it's really start small, um, you know, think about you know, where you can get the most impact, what's the right type of campaign for those accounts, executing, you know, iterating, learning, measuring performance, iterating on that, and learning on that, and then taking it to the next level based upon the data you get out of that process. And how many of you have not yet found this? Yeah, so it, like personally and with our clients, what we what we run, like you mentioned, Google SVN, we get all the runs on qualified leads. And you know, when I was running ads on you know, Google and just went on LinkedIn in the past, I remember it was like mass of qualified and all of a sudden you get a qualified lead and you know you bigger amounts of workload. Now that we only do targeted ads, so I look on LinkedIn or Facebook, we only go after the ads on target accounts. Is the opposite. When we get an unqualified lead, we're like, what's going on here? Why do we have an unqualified lead coming through? And it's a different opinion. So that's why if you, if the only thing you can do is just run the same as you're doing today, but just run it through that target account, it's, it's going to get a very different result. Yeah, I'm saying it's, it's funny, I remember when I was, I was measuring some of the performance of that stuff, I saw this huge ROI number. I was like, oh my god, this is killing it. I don't know what this is. Seems to be that big of a change, but it's killing it. And I dug into the, the pipeline meeting with some of those deals, and there was this one like whale deal that came through. It was a big ad deal, and it closed like really quick. And, what, and when I started looking at some of the data and kind of the journey, what I found was it was already an existing customer. And what they did was they just typed in demand dates, hit our ad, hit the contact me form, the rep followed up with them, and just did the big one. Yeah. yeah, so like, you know, that was one of those things like, well, maybe what we need to be doing for you know, those accounts when they, they come through the ads and things like that is driving them to a demo request more. I'm like, we should be putting up a page that says, hi, I'm your rep, here's my contact information. But he was throwing off all my numbers and I didn't factor that into the deal. Yeah, I, mean, I see a lot of like, uh, SEO and Google Analytics and all <laughs> uh, 
Then the last question I want to ask you for, uh, for next year, what are some of your campaign ideas that you're thinking about doing? You don't know maybe if you're going to do it or not, but what is, what is some of the things that you would like to try to launch? Yeah, so what I just kind of referenced is the, uh, the kind of targeted microsites for some of our strategic accounts. Um, we're going to be working on that, and um, really, you know, it's, it's a microsite for that account, so that not only is marketing content, and these are most of these are customers who are trying to understand. So it's, it's, it's less a bunch of marketing content, where there will be some of the primary product spec sheets or, you know, uh, ebooks or stuff that might be relevant, but really it's, it's a resource for that account manager go in and create that experience for that account and say, you know, hey, here's our last campaign wrap-up summary. And by the way, at that call, you know, we talked about X, Y, and Z, and you wanted information on, on these other products, and they can put the product sheets up there and things like that. And oh, by the way, we have the, you know, your case study up in here as well, so that other divisions in the company they can share it, they can come and see what that division is doing. So and then they can see that engagement with those other divisions are, are showing up. So um, that's something I'm working on. Another one which is uh, interesting is we're, we're leading in a lot more of our, our co-selling and channel uh, partners. Um, we just developed a, an ecosystem of, of partnerships with agency and technology last year. So uh, we've been managing that very ad hoc spreadsheets, you know, old school kind of stuff. Um, and now we're really investing some technology to really streamline that and we can get that kind of B-load overlaps very easily. We can figure out you know, who, who are the, the, the teams on each side of the house that should be working together. We'll Co-work with deals and things like that, um, and then we're actually um, we talked about this for years, and we're finally delivering and doing that. Right? Is we're developing um, buyer persona campaigns, which sounds really interesting for a company of where we are to not have to do it, but trying to develop content that resonates with different um, players in, in the organic strategy. So everywhere from you know management to operations to the management to field um, to digital and so forth. Um, you know, Times we talked about that and how we're playing a role, but haven't developed content specifically for them. So, kind of leading into doing some of that stuff uh, as well. So, we can get some more um, really drill down personal content for the people uh, as opposed to the account. So, as much as ABM is still about accounts and obviously still people all behind them, and, and the more we can provide value to the individuals there and the questions they have, um, you know, the more effective we can be in engaging those accounts. And, and really, I think. Mean, these conversations with marketers in, in different uh, roles, and it frees us up to actually do work as opposed to be needing, not that that's bad, but it's high value uh, interactions. But like I, you know, I said, like, I'll, I'll, I'll be here as soon as I can close to 5 30. I was on a, a client call until uh, a little after 5. Um, and really, it was a marketing operations person trying to ask details like, so how do I configure this in, in Salesforce? Like, not even a product. What is this going to look like? And my, my sales or my sales ops team is pretty locked down on Salesforce. And how much flexibility am I going to have to do things myself in there? So just kind of explaining to her about here's how it actually works. You don't need to be a full admin. You need to see what user likes and you think no. Um, and then here's how you need to think about you know, configuring things or get data into other systems and, and things like that. So those types of personas and those conversations we can scale that stuff out by providing that content to the line that kind of all our thing that the market is doing. Um, one last point that I want to add is this is something that I had in the past, and I'm not sure how we applied but when I was full time, one of the best channels we were running, particularly a branch and also optimized, was uh, VIP dinners. So if you're selling to large enterprise accounts, we started doing that and we tested it. We started with uh, two VIP dinners on Q1, then we did three in Q2, then we did five in Q3, and then we did ten in Q4. So it really started ramping up, and the reason for that was. Because when we looked at the pipeline uh, in terms of like conversion of opportunity, those were the number one challenge. It's a lot of work, like you do anything on it yet. You have to do in different cities, you have to look at what the cities are. But for us, it was such an awesome uh, channel to engage current customer and prospects and make them talk together. And we were driving a conversation. It wasn't just bring that plan on the chat. We had uh, People question we could ask the entire people, we go around the table, so we keep the number between 15 and 20 people. We go around the table, everyone will respond to all those questions, introduce themselves, and make this very great conversation. Everyone has a good time, but 
it allows us to really get close to the decision making in those, uh, those accounts. And so this is an enterprise, but uh, when you look at the pipeline, it's, it's really driving the numbers. And I think your ABM conference is probably out there too. I have a lot of experience in like, running our own events as well, like the conference, digital conference, not meetups. And those were like really high pipeline like, numbers. Um, if, if we felt that um, those types of VIP dinners and those more intimate experiences, we, we used to do a lot of them to generate pipeline. I was talking earlier about kind of like pipeline that attribution, like robbing attribution from the more top of the funnel campaigns and that complex journey. When we first started you know, looking at it from that perspective, everything was going to the field. Man, the field is killing it's doing well. But what I really wanted was it was just the one that was there at the right time. And so we now use those as pipeline acceleration campaigns. Typically end up being um, deals that are inside and don't publish this online, but it's a flip my funnel approach. <laughs> uh, but it really is, right? Because you're bringing in customers and the prospects together, and, and you know, the best of the mandates to just kind of have these types of conversations. And it really helps people feel comfortable moving forward, especially in the space like ABM, where it's like, it all makes great sense. Now, after, you know, you hear somebody talk about it, and you go back to the office and try to do it, and you're like, wait a minute, it was so clear over there, and now a little bit. So, I think it just helps to bridge the gap there and give them the, the confidence that they can do so. Yeah, and uh, sorry, well, the problem with the user conference uh, is, is also a way to make them feel like you know you become personal with them. Uh, we invite them all the time to my friends, we did the user conference, we invited all the people that were in the pipeline, open opportunities to the customer as well as prospect, and that brought the deal to the close. And even though it's like national, that's just launching a trade show, use the opportunity not only for the attendees of the trade show, but whoever else is on your target account list and kind of bring them in. You know, double down on that event that you're really spending on to go outside of the event to drive the performance. I mean, the, the, the performance of those events, it doesn't matter if they're people like or not, right? So you can really kind of double down on this as well. Good. So if you guys think of ABM across the entire cycle, right? You apply ABM to your the customer. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> we're definitely not as good on that side. And, and quite frankly, you know, you talk about sales and marketing alignment. I think the the part that doesn't get as much attention is alignment with, with the in our company's called the CXO, the customer experience organization, uh, or used to be customer success. So you don't see as much of it there, but it's the same exact principles, right? You can take your customers, you can divide them up and say, you know, these customers have these products, but they're showing interest in others, or we want them to have interest in others. Run some campaigns against that. Uh, another way we looked at it, um, which this never really got off the ground, but what I was thinking about is the first year of a, um, of a new customer, every quarter had a different objective. So, like, the first quarter was you know, getting them to sit up on the product and use it. The second quarter was getting them to value. The third quarter was trying to you know, cross sell, upsell some idea, and drive some interest there. And the fourth quarter was driving renewal. So, it's very easy to look at those, those time bases and align marketing campaigns. You know, advertising against those accounts that align with, with those buckets to make sure that you know that message is resonating not only in their experience with their brand but also in what their account managers are, are saying. So um, you know, we haven't been as good at that as we uh, it really should be, uh, but we acknowledge that it absolutely is required and is extremely important, especially as you go in to strategic accounts where you know part of it's a customer, part of it's not. Um, you know, that's really where. Drives that, that growth and that, that extension of your footprint within there. So, yeah, it's not just that new acquisition, right? It's, but my answer that I've been working with a seller client in the last few years that when I'm starting with India, it's not a phase one thing. So, normally, yeah. phase one try to keep, already, is already overwhelming to try to get the customer acquisition part right. Once you get there, you feel like you feel pretty good, then you want to start like. Doing more, maybe you have more people, and with that, so you can start focusing on that spend, on renewal, on term customer, and all of that. But if you start with it from the, the first day, it's going to be too much. With the quality, with kind of doing that, do you think they would hire a new headcount to do some of the customer work? Or do you think it would be an extension on the. I mean, it depends on your bandwidth, your headcount, or how much more you're going to give you, but uh, we have a customer market, right? So they're, they're charging the limit. Of what the customer work is. 
So much like you know, Salesforce and then the lower acquisition cost for might have a slightly different set of benchmarks or, or the metrics they're going after. And I think the key there is making sure you know that as a marketing organization in our efforts to support them, we'll align with their their KPIs as well. So for example, one of our initiatives in 2020 um, is we need to get more of our customers certified for certification programs because we find that um, prospect for a customer when we have more cert when there's at least one person who's certified in there. Ability to you know or to close or to retain goes up pretty dramatically, so that's another component. Um, another you know, thing we found is that when we're working with partners more frequently, um, that's driving a lot of performance for us too on, on the net uh, acquisition side. So um, you know, some of our insights we've been able to pull in our 2020 planning have shown that. So now as we go into 2020, those are going to be key, key focuses for us. Any other questions? Last minute? No. Oh, perfect. Thank you again, John. Thank you, thanks everyone for having us in the end of the year. Um, again, if you have ideas uh, on the topics, if you want to speak next year, please reach out to me, practicalassassinsgirl.com, send us an email, and we will we'll make it as it happens. Thanks again, and hope to see you next year.